Attention-grabbing, extreme weather-related incidents, and global concerns about air pollution, rising tides, warming seas, extended droughts, wildfires, and massive flooding have motivated California state government to pass legislation with very stringent carbon emission reductions requirements. These restrictions, coupled with the regulatory authority and oversight of the California Air Resources Board, known as CARB, are weighing heavily on cargo and freight transportation industries. CARB is proposing that all cargo handling equipment in seaports and rail yards begin utilizing zero emission equipment in year 2022, with 100% compliance required for all yard equipment by 2031. By comparison, other California industries will have until year 2050 to reduce their emissions to 20% of 1990 levels. The California goods movement industry today finds itself in the crosshairs of a sharply focused and ambitiously determined effort to protect the environment and achieve zero emissions. This effort and its ripple effects come at a time when the Southern California logistics industry faces renewed, revitalized, and growing competition from East Coast ports and a gradual Western shift in the geographic centers of manufacturing in the supply chain. Market share percentages and the associated jobs and economic activity are at stake as the local industry and ports adjust, evolve, and scramble to meet the new requirements. So with the advent of the widening of the Panama Canal, uh, raising of, of uh, the bridge in New York, other infrastructure improvements, these shippers will take a look at that and say, hey, we have other options now. Uh, so it's, I don't think it's anything that, that the West Coast has not done specifically to keep up with the competitiveness. Uh, it's more opportunities that the beneficial cargo owners see that has created a little bit of the shift of market share from West Coast to East Coast and Gulf Coast ports. Uh, it all depends on reliability. Um, the shippers want to get their goods uh, to their customers as efficiently as possible, and they have many more options today than they may have 10, 12, 15 years ago. Fortunately for the region, the San Pedro Bay ports of Los Angeles and Long Beach have been reducing emissions steadily in the harbor since the first pioneering Clean Air Action Plan, known as CAP, was adopted in 2006. The environmentally friendly, comprehensive set of emission reduction programs implemented by CAP partnered industry with government and the community to achieve a dramatic reduction of diesel particulate matter by 87% in the last 12 years. The Clean Air Action Plan is now entering its third iteration, with the latest updated version adopted by both ports in November of 2017. By progressively addressing emissions concerns, the current CAP will pursue compliance with CARB's requirements and contribute substantially to the state's overall efforts to reduce greenhouse gases. The new Clean Air Action Plan update was an incredibly collaborative effort by many stakeholders and builds on our port's environmental achievements over the last decade. The new CAP sets the bar high, but the Port of Los Angeles is committed to leading the way. We believe that economic growth and environmental stewardship can be mutual goals. Over the past two years, our port has broken records for cargo growth while reducing emissions by as much as 40% per container. The plan will help accelerate the use, commercial viability, and demand for next generation near zero and zero emission technology. I'm very proud that the Port of Los Angeles is considered a model for sustainability and is the cleanest gateway in the world. We look forward to continuing this trend. Well, the core value for the Port of Long Beach is to have, as I indicated, a sustainable model in terms of how we conduct our business. That model includes your social corporate responsibility. So as the core of that objective to reduce emissions, and now, of course, in the 2017 version of the Cleaner Action Plan, to eliminate emissions, not just reduce them, eliminate. I think that moves forward with the way our thought process has been here, going back to the Greenport policy, which is to make sure that we grow green. And in this particular case, we're actually going to get to a point where there will be no emissions with regard to whether as a result of transportation uh, related, like, for example, trucks and or cargo handling equipment. So those are worthy goals. And again, that's right in line with our mission statement in terms of being the green port of the future. Without question, 
The 2017 version of the Clean Air Action Plan will require some heavy lifting, substantial expense, and faith that new technologies will emerge in time to meet the new goals and deadlines. Specifically, the goals state that 100% of off-road yard handling equipment operating in the harbor will be tailpipe emission-free by the year 2030. At present, the technology does not exist to facilitate these new standards. Marine terminals will be hampered and face delays in fulfilling zero-emission policies until such technology is developed, tested, and implemented. The ports have set a goal for on-road vehicles, including semi-trucks, to generate zero tailpipe emissions by 2035. Interim benchmark goals for ultra-low or near-zero emissions from trucks and yard equipment are set to begin with incentives as early as 2019 or 2020. The initial Clean Air Action Plan in 2006 involved implementing new technologies along with adopting effective new policies, such as reducing vessel speeds for ships approaching the harbor and establishing use of low sulfur fuels. These adjustments achieved the goals of greening the harbor and cleaning the air. As time progressed, more efficient diesel truck engines manufactured with the newest 2007 EPA-rated engines allowed newer drayage trucks to replace older, more polluting vehicles through the partially grant-funded Clean Truck Program. Simultaneously, natural gas vehicles in the terminal yards and the beginnings of onshore powering for idling ships helped bring down air pollution significantly. Altogether, harbor improvements reduced overall particulate matter by more than 85 percent, nitrous oxides by more than 50 percent, and sulfur oxides by more than 95 percent. Now that older truck engines manufactured prior to 2007 have disappeared from the harbor, the next wave of truck technology must step forward. All eyes are upon an industry where experts say technology may be at least two leaps away from manufacturing reliable, zero-emission, heavy-duty trucks that can operate for 400 miles or more on one battery charge. Current battery technology in the prototype phase for semi-trucks can operate only for a maximum distance of 100 miles. According to media reports, various truck manufacturers are competing to build ultra-low emission vehicles through hybridization and fuel cell applications. Mack Trucks, Daimler, Cummins, Volvo, and other companies are working on near-zero hybrids, fuel cells, and or all electrical trucks. Tesla is making a public relations splash with its prototype all-electric truck with driverless options. Natural gas-powered vehicles already satisfy the ultra-low emission standards for heavy trucks and may provide an interim bridge until battery power is sufficient to provide the 400-mile range desired while meeting the port's ultimate goal of zero tailpipe emissions. We've identified a few of the solutions, right? So the, the zero electric, the natural gas engines, the hydrogen fuel cells, those exist and there's a lot more technology improvements that can be done, but there's really a question is there going to be a, uh, a new battery technology that really is a, a revolution as opposed to the evolutionary uh, improvements? And so um, that we don't know. And, and I think if we had that big jump in, say, energy density for a battery, then we would see quite a bit of uh, um, help in, in terms of that long haul issue. In the marine terminals, every piece of moving equipment from gantry cranes to top loaders to hostlers must operate at zero emission capability by 2030. Some terminals are testing the latest battery-powered yard equipment and the automated Middle Harbor facility is using battery-powered vehicles. However, technology has not been developed or tested which would fully transition operations in a conventional, non-automated yard. Alternative fuel vehicles, including natural gas-powered equipment, have been operating as ultra-low emission options for about a decade on a smaller scale. Container and cruise ships will be required to connect to electrical sources at the dock through a process known as cold ironing, or alternative marine powering. The twin ports of the San Pedro Bay recognize that the future in a zero-emissions environment will mean that more electrical power needs to be supplied to the harbor. Yard vehicles and ships will require recharging and direct connection capability. 
A substantial degree of energy management planning is occurring at both ports, from an energy initiative in the San Pedro Bay to an energy management action plan to assure greater energy supplies will be coming in the future from sustainable sources. The cost of retrofitting marine terminals adding new infrastructure elements and replacing the current trucking fleet to meet zero emission standards is estimated to be somewhere between seven to fourteen billion dollars. The question of who will pay for all of the upgrades usually results in discussions about grants, increased leasing charges for marine terminals, and even possible fees on trucks. It remains an open question as to how much elasticity is left for discretionary cargo before the elastic band is broken and larger percentages of containers start moving to other points of entry. The San Pedro Bay has lost about 3 to 4 percent of market share to East Coast and Gulfport competition in the last few years. Beneficial cargo owners will have an important voice regarding strategic goods movement planning and likely would opt to either reroute some discretionary cargo or pass along some of the new costs to clients and customers down the line. This potential impact of the cap and CARB requirements will have bearing on striking the balance between competitiveness and rapidly reduced emissions. Well, I know that the BCOs are very, very nervous about what the cost implications are for this. Um, we all see this as a uh, a tidal wave of cost coming at us. Maybe tidal wave isn't, isn't the right word, but a wave of, of additional costs that are just going to make it more and more difficult, more expensive to bring cargo into this port. So you'll have some BCOs that, as I said earlier, um, will divert cargo to other ports in, in the goal of reducing their costs. Uh, and you'll have some of the, the uh, BCOs here in the state that are forced to accept this. But what you will see is an inevitable uh, transfer of these costs to the consumer. Port authorities are actively pursuing an increase in the percentage of containers that load directly onto rail to reduce truck trips within and near the harbor area. To allow for anticipated cargo growth in the future, the plan is to transfer as much as 50% of containers from ships directly to rail for the long haul trip to the Midwest and possibly to an offshore inland rail hub in Southern California for redistribution via local trucks. Because goods movement, trade, and the logistics industry account for about one of every nine jobs in the Southern California region, any change in the current arrangements could have an impact on the area's employment status and the resulting economic prospects. Mindful of this nexus, a separate but related strategic planning effort is titled California Sustainable Freight Action Plan. That action plan takes into account the variables involving population growth, community impact, and the need to steward the goods movement industry in ways that sustain vitality without damaging the environment. The Sustainable Freight Action Plan considers new technologies and updated logistics planning methods which streamline the throughput of cargo containers. These methods enable efficiencies in a redesigned and modernized appointment system to overcome and control congestion and wasted time. We can figure things out. Uh, we've proven that over and over again. We've proven that we're resilient. And I think the thing that is really encouraging to me is all the relationships that have been formed, um, all of the folks that are talking to each other. Um, we were all guilty, and you all have heard me say this over the years, we all stayed in our own silo. You know, if you were in commercial real estate, you kind of knew your, your business. If you were at the ports, you kind of knew your business. And when the Tidelands Trust border was there, you just said, okay, you know, we've done our jobs. And I think all of us, we've gotten to know each other. We've tried to understand the other's business model. So I think we've made tremendous strides. I think we lose sight of that. We kind of forget how far we've come. The residents of the areas most affected by goods movement can take laudable credit for the end results of greener ports and cleaner air. Active voices and concerns expressed through legislators and litigation have contributed to the ongoing developments in environmental mitigation. Various proactive solutions have improved the human health prospects in harbor area communities. 
the Clean Air Action Plan provides an opportunity for the local ports and the harbor industry to continue with direct action the rapid progress made in the past dozen years. Already perceived as a model of environmental consideration in the global trade sphere, the San Pedro Bay's solutions in the near future, in the next dozen years, will set the standard for other harbor logistics industries worldwide facing similar challenges. Although the immediate road ahead will have its costs, setbacks, and uncertainties, achieving the goal of zero emissions in a thriving harbor community will resonate through improved quality of life and ongoing economic opportunity if balanced carefully. And best of all, this will occur while greatly pleasing Mother Nature.